All right, thanks everybody. Thank you for joining the Animus River Community Forum meeting today. Before we get started, I'm just gonna go over a few logistics. Um, so as you might've just heard, this meeting is being recorded and we ask that you remain muted until we open it up for questions. But feel free to um, type in a question or share your comments in the chat box um, or raise your hand when the presenters ask for your questions. Also feel free to include any uh, news, events, or resources that you would like shared in the meeting notes or in future newsletters, feel free to pass those along. We'll make sure those are shared with um, Animus River Community Forum or ARC Forum partners. So to get started, we're going to do some really quick intros. Um, we're going to have to be fast because there's a lot of us, but I think it's really nice to know who's on the call. And so I'm going to call on folks. Let me know if I miss anyone. And when I call on you, Please state your name and your job title and the organization that you are representing today. Um, so I'll kick us off. My name is Mandy Eskelson. I'm a water program research associate for Mountain Studies Institute. And along with my colleague, Amanda Kenzie, we help coordinate the Animus River Community Forum. Um, and I'll pass it off to Amanda. Hi, I'm Amanda Kenzie. I'm the community science director here at Mountain Studies. and um, yeah, like what Mandy just said. Uh, and I'll let Mandy call on the next person. Okay, John. Hi, so I'm John Ott. I live at the James Ranch up in the Nanos Valley and I'm uh, on the Water Quality Control Commission and the Citizens Advisory Group uh, for the EPA up in Silverton. Thanks, John. Uh, Callie and Nicole. Hi, I am Nicole Fox, founder of Give a Dam. And I am Callie, uh, Give a Dam summer intern. Thank you. And Nicole Seltzer. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nicole Seltzer with River Network. I'm the Colorado River Basin Program Director. And I am up in the opposite part of the state. I'm up in Steamboat Springs. Thanks, Nicole. And Marsha? Hi, Marcia Porter Norton. I am a La Plata County Commissioner. Thank you. And Alyssa? Oh, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Alyssa Richmond. I'm the coordinator for the San Juan Watershed Group in New Mexico and employee of the San Juan Salt Water Conservation District. Thanks, Alyssa. How about Paula and Clyde? Hi, I'm Paula Church. I'm president of the Falls Creek Ranch HOA and Firewise Ambassador and on Wildfire Adaptive Partnership Board. And this is Clyde Church County Commissioner. Thanks, guys. Laura? Hi, my name is Laura Spann. I'm Programs Coordinator with the Southwestern Water Conservation District. Good to see you all. Thanks, Laura. Lucas? Oh, Lucas, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry about that. My name is Lucas Vecchio. I'm an ecologist and a geospatial specialist with Rocky Mountain Ecology. Thank you. And Ellen? Uh, good afternoon, Ellen Roberts. I am a member of the Southwest Basin Roundtable and a longtime ARC Forum uh, participant. Thank you. Stacy? Hi, everyone. I'm Stacy Bowe with Strategic by Nature, and I'm here today in my capacity supporting River Network with Stream Management Planning. Nice to see you. Thanks, Stacey. Warren? I'm Warren Ryder, hydrologist at Ryder Resources and the coordinator for the Animus Watershed Partnership. Thanks, Warren. Ashley? Hi, I'm Ashley Rust. I'm a researcher at the Colorado School of Mines, um, and I've been doing some fire work with Mandy and Scott on the 416, so I'll be reporting on that today. Thank you. Jimbo? Hi, I'm Jimbo Buick Rood. Greetings to everyone. Um, I'm, for the most part, today the Lands and Forest Program Manager for San Juan Citizens Alliance and also represent uh, the Hermosa Company. But I'm the president of that's in the Hermosa area. Thank you. Thanks, Jimbo. I know it's hard to choose so many titles, right? Uh, Elaine. Hi, I'm Elaine Chick with the Water Information Program in Durango. I'm also the Southwest Basin Roundtable, Public Education Participation and Outreach Liaison. Thank you, Nate. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nate Peters. I am the Watershed Program Manager with uh, Southwest Conservation Corps based in Durango. Uh, for those of you in the past who may have uh, collaborated with Emily uh, Cassian, I'll be kind of stepping into her position. Welcome. Thanks for that update. Anthony? Hi, all. Yeah, Anthony Culpepper. I'm uh, the Associate Director for the Forest Program here at Mountain Studies, and I'm here today representing the Four Rivers Resilient Forest Collaborative um, as uh, with my role as coordinator for that organization. Thank you. Helen? Hey, everyone. My name is Helen Kadich. I'm the Southwest Regional Rep for Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you. Melissa? Hey everyone, I'm Melissa May. I'm the district manager for San Juan Soil and Water Conservation District in Aztec and a steering committee member for Animus Watershed Partnership and San Juan Watershed Group. Awesome. Lindsay? Hi everyone, Lindsay Hansen. I'm the Renewable Resource Staff Officer on the San Juan National Forest. Thank you, Paul? Hi everyone, I'm Paul Montoya. I'm a water resource specialist I work for the city of Farmington, New Mexico, and that sums up my game. Thanks, Paul. Tammy? I'm Tammy Sheldon. I'm a hydrotech with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation in Durango. Thanks, Tammy. Ryan? Hi, I'm Ryan Cox. I'm with the Colorado State Forest Service in Durango. Thanks, Ryan. James? Hi, I'm James Evangelisti. I'm the water quality technician with the Southern Ute Tribe. Thank you. Steve? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Steve Wolf. I'm the new general manager at Southwestern Water District. Thank you. Marcel? Howdy, folks. My name is Marcel Gazdenbeid. I'm a hydrogeologist and work as the Animus River Keeper with San Juan Citizens Alliance. I'm also on the Bonita Peak Community Advisory Group and on the steering committees for the Amateur River Community Forum and the San Juan Watershed Group. Oh, all right, Rob? Hey, I'm Rob Perino, Emergency Management Coordinator with La Plata County. Thank you. Jordan? Sorry for the delay. Uh, Jordan Dimmick with SGM and engineer here in Durango. Jordan, Scott. Hey everyone, this is Scott Roberts, uh, aquatic ecologist with Mountain Studies Institute. Scott, Ty. Afternoon, everybody. My name is Ty Churchwell. I'm on staff for National Trout Unlimited out of our Durango office and also on the Bonita Peak Community Advisory Group. Thanks, Ty. Gigi? Hi, I'm Gigi Richard. I'm the director of the Four Corners Water Center at Fort Lewis College. Thank you. Um, Steve? No? Hi, I'm Steve Monroe, a hydroecologist, and I'm here today representing myself. Sounds good. And I feel like I missed one of the county commissioners calling in. Mandy, I don't think so. I think it's just Commissioner Church and myself today. Sounds great. Okay, did I get everyone? Unless a commissioner from another county, San Juan County, is calling in. Got quite the crowd. Well, thank all of you for um, those introductions. It's really nice to know who's who's participating, who's in the room and joining the conversation. And um, speaking of thanks, we really want to express our gratitude to our ARC Forum sponsors this year and to our steering committee members. They devoted a lot of time and effort to helping identify some meeting topics that they thought would be relevant and important for our communities to discuss in 2021. And so if any of you would like to also join um, the steering committee or have meeting topic suggestions, feel free to um, send us your info in the chat box or in a follow up meeting after this or a follow up email after this meeting. Um, before we jump into today's meeting details, I just kind of wanted to remind the group um, that for the Animus River Community Forum, we have these broad goals, three of them to strengthen coordination, connect resources to people, and plan for the future. 
And some may say that this group in the past has kind of had to form and had to be reactive to disturbance events. So forming after the Gold King mine incident and then kind of re-energizing after the 416 fire. And I think, you know, we really have an opportunity for the momentum that we've had over the past couple of years to keep that going and really to be proactive. And like that last goal says, plan for the future. And so with that in mind, this year with our meeting topics um, in April, we brought forward um, speakers to talk about drought and wildfire preparation and planning. And then in this fall in October, we hope to bring presenters to talk about forest collaborative efforts, um, such things as like the Rocky Mountain Research Initiative, hearing updates from the Upper Animas area, so like the Bonita Peak Mining District, um, talking about specific projects like the American Dipper projects and perhaps some stories on um, increased recreation impacts on public lands. Uh, but today for this meeting, we're really hoping to share info on funding mechanisms, policies, and monitoring efforts that are related to our watershed and highlight how these could help inform future planning and projects. And so We've got um, quite the, the presenter lineup today, and they may seem a little bit all over the place, but our goal was to try and cover um, all these efforts happening at uh, uh, bring it in from a broad perspective. So hearing from state and regional uh, efforts and then zooming in on um, local monitoring and research. And so first off, we're gonna hear from Nicole Seltzer and Stacy Bow from River Network, and they're gonna be talking about stream management planning. And then we're gonna hear from John Ott of the Colorado Water Quality Control Commission to talk about water quality listings and standards updates. And then we're gonna hear from Dr. Ashley Russ from Colorado School of Mines to talk about the 416 Fire Aquatic Monitoring Project. And lastly, we're gonna hear from Nicole Fox and Callie Truitt um, from Give a Damn Nonprofit and from Fort Lewis College to talk about beaver habitat mapping. And then we're going to also hear from some of our ARC forums for updates um, from La Plata County, Southwestern Water Conservation District, as well as the San Juan Watershed Group. And then if we have any extra time, we'd love to hear from other ARC forum partners if you'd like to give an update as well. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Nicole Seltzer and Stacey Bow. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks, Mandy. Thanks, Stacy, for getting that up. Um, so Mandy asked us to talk a little bit about kind of big picture stream management planning in the state of Colorado, what it is, why people are doing it, what we're finding um, from where they're being done. And then um, Stacy is going to zoom in a little bit into the southwestern part of the state and, and go over some of the processes that are happening in your part of the world. Um, and then we're going to sort of leave you with some, some questions and next steps to ponder. So um, I'm going to start big picture and then we'll sort of get more specific to, to your needs and goals as we go over the next you know, 20 minutes or so. Um, so a little bit of history on stream management plans. Um, the Colorado Water Plan in 2015 set a goal of 80% of locally prioritized reaches of river having a stream management plan by 2030. Um, so what does that really mean? <laughs> well, stream management plans weren't necessarily a thing prior to the Colorado Water Plan of 2015. There were a lot of people doing watershed planning at different scales and kind of with different focuses. And um, the development of the stream management plan program at CWCB was really meant to provide a funding stream and kind of a systematic way to tackle um, some, some river health goals at the state. And I went back a few months ago, CWCB asked me to present at a workshop for all of the Basin Roundtable environmental and recreational representatives to talk a little bit about you know, where we've come from with stream management planning. And so I went back and I looked through notes from 2015 to, to really try to understand like what were we even trying to accomplish with this program way back when. And there were really three primary driving hopes. Um, the first was that CWCB through the water plan was hoping that each basin would prioritize the stream reaches within their boundaries to assess them for both um, their current conditions and solutions to problems, um, sort of locally driven prioritization process. 
The second was that they wanted to identify and begin to close the environmental and rec water gap. Um, if you'll remember, you know, the water plan and before that, the SWAZI process, a lot of it was really driven by trying to understand current and future demands, um, water demands throughout the state. And the environmental and recreational water gap was always really difficult to um, identify. There were lots of plans and processes for municipal water use and how, you know, how to forecast those, but nobody really understood how to get your arms around what is the environmental water gap. And so stream management plans were supposed to be one mechanism to be able to do that. And then finally, there was increased funding through CWCB's Watershed Restoration Grant Program to help communities pay for river health assessments and to then implement stream management plans and the resulting recommendations. So those are really why these processes came about in the first place. Um, so what is a stream management plan kind of through the definition of CWCB? Um, we've, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about what River Network's role is um, in the in programs and kind of what our services are related to stream management plans. Um, but in general, CWCB, to be eligible for a grant for stream management plans, there are some fundamental elements um, that you need to consider in, in, a, in a grant application to CWCB to do these. And so they, they really are, they're voluntary stakeholder driven assessments of flow and other physical river conditions that culminate in management actions or rec or project recommendations. That really is at, in a nutshell, that's it. Um, it is a stakeholder driven assessment of current conditions of your river and you have to come up with some solutions to fix problems that you identify. That in a nutshell is what they are. And so they're really um, open-ended, I think, CWCB very intentionally left it open-ended to sort of how these are done at a local scale, what your goals can be. And, and there's a lot of examples of different communities undertaking these in really different ways. Um, Stacy, can you go to the next slide, please? There are um, a couple of examples that I wanted to show you guys. And, you know, so some of the key points are really about um, assessments. So how do you assess your river? And then what is what are those project plans or recommendations look like? So this is the, a completed river health assessment from the Poudre River in the Fort Collins area. The city of Fort Collins undertook this. This is one of the first stream management plans that CWCB paid for. Um, and essentially the way that they did it was they looked at a whole slew of river characteristics of, of different variables of river systems and they gave them an A through F grade and then they rolled them up into um, almost a report card for the basin. Um, a lot of, of the communities that are undertaking these river assessment processes do something very similar where they'll, they'll set sort of grading ranges for themselves and they'll say, well, riparian condition in this reach of river is an A and downstream it's a C. And, um, you know, they'll look at fisheries habitat. They'll look at water quality. You know, there's a whole list of variables that you can start to dig into. And how deeply you dig into those really depends on how much data you have available to you or how much data you want to collect. Um, and how big your budget is and how long you want the process to take. And, and so you see processes where they just do a really quick snapshot of, um, of certain variables, and then they do a really deep dive on others. And it's really up to the community how you decide to go about that. Um, and then in the lower right of that screen is the Middle Colorado project plan. The Middle Colorado Watershed Council finished their stream management plan just, for, I think, early 2021 or late 2020. Um, and there were something like 50 some recommendations that came out of that planning process. And this is a snapshot of one of those. And so for each of the recommendations, you know, they did a river health assessment, they did a bunch of stakeholder work, and then this is kind of the culmination of what came out is basically these project plan sheets, which identify, you know, what is the action they're saying should happen, who's gonna lead it, what's the budget, what's the funding source, what's the, um, you know, what's the schedule to get it done. And so as a community, they came together and they identified you know actions that they as a group can support and get behind so there's um, like I said like 50 some that came out of the middle Colorado so those are just some examples of the kind of work products that you can come out of these processes with um, next slide Stacy and so 
one of the questions that people often ask about this, because there's a lot of different kinds of planning, right? There's like watershed scale, um, like fire health planning. There's specific reach river restoration planning. And so you do these sort of assessments in this planning work at a lot of different scales. And so I like to think about stream management plans as kind of being in the middle between a larger watershed plan and a project plan. And so the kinds of questions that you ask and thus the kinds of information that you need are different at different scales. So a larger watershed scale assessment might look at you know fish populations in the entire basin and it might describe the hydrology and water use patterns for an entire watershed when you get down to a stream management plan your questions are going to change you're going to ask something like where are there important where is the important aquatic habitat that we want to protect which diversion structures pose you know pose fish passage barriers so you're getting into you know a finer a finer spatial scale um, and then you eventually have to get to the point of developing your project plans. So how do I improve fish habitat at this site? How does this specific diversion structure better deliver water and allow fish passage? And so hopefully that kind of gives you a sense of where stream management plans fall in the overall scale of watershed planning um, in the state. So uh, the next slide, thanks Stacey. So in terms of where we're at with these in Colorado, there are 26 plans that are either completed or in progress today. And this is a map, um, this map is available on a resource library website that River Network and CWCD have put together. There are, um, this is sort of an interactive map and for each of these, there's actually a fact sheet. And so you can kind of zoom in and look at the specifics of each project. Um, and Stacey just put that link in the chat. And, and so we highlighted the, the three that are happening in southwestern Colorado, and Stacey's going to talk a little bit more about those. Um, but there are about 20, there are 26 completed or ongoing plans, or maybe it's 20, yeah, 26. Um, and there's a few more every year. Every year there's probably three or four more that come online. We're, get, we're getting to see some implementation. Um, you know, Steamboat, the, the Yampa through Steamboat, the Crystal River, um, near Carbondale, Poudre and Fort Collins, the Rio Grande, they're all moving into actual, you know, project recommendations and implementation. So we're starting to see results from these processes now, but it really is a little too early to say like this many miles of stream have been restored and this many fish species are, are benefiting because that kind of, you know, project work takes years. Um, but we are starting to see project recommendations moving forward. Um, one thing I wanted to notice to you guys is that, you know, of these 26 plans, they are each really unique. Their goals are unique. The kinds of methodologies they're using to assess variables are unique. And the kind of leadership structure that they have is unique. So there are conservation districts um, that are managing plans in the Mancus and the White. There are watershed groups that are overseeing them in other places. There are cities and municipalities and um, water conservancy districts that are overseeing them. So it really kind of depends upon who is best suited and has the capacity and interest to lead these processes. They are a big investment of time and money. The budgets tend to be anywhere from, you know, $100,000 at the really small end to um, ours up here in the Yampa Basin is about 600000 So they really are a large investment of, of time and money. And so you need to make sure that your leadership capacity is, is aligned. Um, there have been about $4 million in watershed rest in CWCB watershed restoration grants given um, between 2016 and 2020. And that has leveraged a total of about $8 million in stream management plan money. So that is, you know, an $8 million investment in river health assessment and prioritization that probably wouldn't have otherwise happened. Um, and we're also seeing some basins start to do some phased assessments of the entire basin. So the Upper Gunnison, the Rio Grande, and the Yampa have all taken a really big watershed approach where they're looking at kind of the entire basin first and then they're prioritizing you know reaches kind of through that process and other places are picking a smaller sub watershed to start with um i did want to pivot a little bit and just talk about river network and our role 
in in this work. I think it's important to sort of give you a sense of, of the kind of support that's available should you decide that you want to embark down this road. Um, and so in 2017, we came to CWCB and said, there's a niche here that, that needs to be filled. Um, nobody really knows what a stream management plan is at this point. Nobody's quite sure how to do them. There needs to be some handholding and support through like through this process for people. And so we worked with CWCB and the Gates Family Foundation to develop um, kind of an initial an initial program that's really grown over the last four years. So the bottom line goal is to generate more and better stream management plans. So we provide a variety of support services to people who choose to undertake stream management plans. These support services are voluntary. People apply to us or they come to us with requests for assistance or technical, technical guidance. Um, this is not something that we force anybody to do. And so some of the services that we provide, we do some just basic outreach like, like today on kind of the what, why, how of stream management plans to get communities thinking about whether it's a good fit for their goals. Um, we can provide grant application support and that includes you know, scoping the activities in the grant, providing some technical assistance to make sure that, you know, you're technically your scopes are good and that your budget is, is healthy enough to support the kind of technical work you might want to do, um, as well as like stakeholder involvement work. Um, we have developed the resource library that I mentioned that Stacy put in the chat which is really a clearinghouse on all of the different ways you can do these processes. And there's a lot of information in there on case studies and best practices and different approaches and goals um, and different methods that you could spend hours reading about. Um, we have a peer learning network. Once you decide to undertake a stream management plan and you um, get a grant from CWCB, we have a formal peer learning network for all of those practitioners. We get those folks together quarterly to talk about how they're doing, what they're doing, what's going well, what's not. Um, we do a lot of, of, you know, trying to figure out what's relevant to people at a given time, and then we'll bring experts in to sort of help them answer some answer questions or, or move their processes forward and, and keep each other connected. Um, and then we also undertook a project starting a couple of years ago where we're tracking the outcomes of stream management plans in the state so that we can understand the impact of the state's investment of, of money as well as the investment of the money and time that everybody else is giving across the state. So we're doing some work to um, to try to understand what these processes are are sort of coming out the other end with. So I will leave it there and turn it over to Stacey. She's going to kind of pick up on that thread and talk a little bit about what we are finding in terms of why people are doing this and what's successful and um, kind of zoom in on on some of the southwestern processes. Awesome, thanks, Nicole. Um, so I'm gonna spend a couple minutes just on the overall benefits and accomplishments that we're seeing at scale. And then um, I already kind of flagged Mandy. I'd love to hear from her on how the Upper San Juan is viewing the success of the process so far. And if anyone's here from the Mancus, we'd love to hear from you all as well too. So um, this outcomes reporting that Nicole's talking about. We're actually um, gonna be publishing a memo here pretty soon that summarizes all of these outcomes and really does a deep dive into what's working, what are the challenges and what are the ongoing recommendations. Um, so look for that soon. Um, but in the meantime, what we're reporting is, you know, 11 SMPs are done. There's actually a couple more that are like sort of halfway done with their phase one. Um, they are recommending 269 projects, and those projects fit into 24 distinct buckets that we've um, identified. So it's really hard to see on this slide, but categories like diversion retrofit, environmental flow target, um, planning, monitoring, data collection, repair and restoration, like a lot of the categories you would think. And about 90% of those projects have other benefits besides the primary project goal. So a diversion retrofit might have um, benefits for boat passage or um, other multi-benefit um, aspects to the project as well. So in, in addition to the project outcomes, um, the recommendations, we're also seeing a lot of other outcomes with these SMPs. So um, there's been some really neat innovations that we've seen across the state and we've really tried to share those on coloradosmp.org and through the peer learning network. 
um, innovations on people trying really new approaches to projects, um, like if it may be a fish passage project, or maybe there's a really unique partnership that we're seeing um, taking place as a result of these plans. So um, we're seeing some really cool things happening on that side. And then the people is really the biggest part of these processes. It's, you know, it's technical, it's about the river, what does the river need, but we're also seeing um, people coming together that have never worked together before and really expanding their uh, perspective and understanding of water and looking at water management in a different way. So we have reports from SMP leads saying, wow, our water managers are actually looking at fish data to make decisions. And we have um, people that maybe thought they really understood the river from their agricultural or municipal standpoint, but haven't really ever looked at um, the environmental or rec or the science. And now they're coming together and using that information in other processes as well. So the amount of information that's being generated out of these SMPs has been really valuable to people um, across the board. And we have a lot more details on that in the memo, but I wanna make sure we have time. So I'm gonna move us on. Um, so locally here, we have the San Miguel River Partnership has been working. Um, they were an outgrowth of the 2015 Basin Implementation Plan. And the goal there was to say, we really don't have a lot of information on environmental and recreational needs in, our, in the Southwest Basin. So let's pilot a stream management plan on the San Miguel. And there's been some starts and stops and it's been really great to see that stakeholder group um, learn from um, learn as they go and make improvements. And I was actually pulled in as the facilitator to help with stakeholder engagement in 2018. And the San Miguel chose to um, characterize existing and historical conditions of the river, sorry for the typo, um, but they looked at these five um, basic attributes. So channel dynamics, riparian vegetation, boating, aquatic biota, and um, angling and to really say, what does the San Miguel River need to support these attributes? So their needs assessment was actually just completed. Um, it's posted on the Roundtable website and I'll put that in the chat here in a minute. Um, but the benefits that we've seen from that group is that we have a trusted, we, the purpose was to get a lot of stakeholders together um, from all different parts of the watershed and all different interests and users in the watershed and bring them together to talk about what's important to them on the river and really deepen their understanding of what the river needs. And that has been accomplished. The needs assessment process was pretty neat to watch um, people coming together, really engaging with their water commissioner and, and getting really into um, the details of the San Miguel River. And hopefully that paved the way for us to have conversations about multi-benefit projects, voluntary multi-benefit projects that stakeholders could come together and work on or support each other as they take them on through their own organizations. So um, we're about, I'm gonna stop there and just um, kick it over to Mandy and see what, if you could just give a quick minute on what benefits you've seen from the Upper San Juan process so far. Yeah, you covered a lot, Stacey. Um, I, I'm lucky to help be a part of the Upper San Juan Watershed Enhancement Partnership that's based out of the Pagosa area, but it's looking at um, the Upper San Juan drainage, the Rio Blanco and the Navajo. And that group has really learned a lot from these um, other groups that have started stream management planning a long time ago. You know, in particular, we have steering committee members who have been part of the San Miguel process and trying to learn from them as well as the Minkus group and um, you know, learning how to outline their process that's gonna be applicable to them. So they're currently in phase three of a three phase process. The first phase it was gathering the stakeholder groups and establishing a steering committee to guide this community during process. And then last year in phase two, we did that technical analysis and assessment. And um, as both Nicole and Stacy highlighted these this um, funding and effort can be really flexible to each, uh, each group's specific needs. And so, for example, you know, a little bit different than the San Miguel group, the, the San Juan group uh, included forest health and water nexus components in their analysis. And so we're pretty interested in, in how we're gonna identify projects related to that, um, not only for wildfire prevention, but what could happen afterwards. And then in phase three now, we're, we're moving on to projects. And so we just have really 
gained a lot of benefits from learning from these other groups and attending these peer calls, seeing what's worked for others, um, figuring out tools and resources along the way. So yeah, it's just, I think it, this is one of the most flexible funding mechanisms I've ever seen. And I think it, it just is constantly evolving too. You know, stream management plans had started off with a really hard focus on environmental and recreation needs, but it has evolved to ensure it incorporates other types of water uses in a watershed. So it can be very flexible. But uh, I'm curious to see uh, if there's any, you know, Steve's involved in the, the Mancus group, or there may be others on the call who may want to chime in on, on their process. Great. Anyone oh. want to chime in now? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Sure, I'll jump in now. Um, I've been working with the Mancus Conservation District on the stream management plan, the stream management plan for the um, Mancus watershed. Um, the Mancus stream watershed, Watershed management or stream management plan, I'm sorry, is um, in phase one and should be wrapping that up in later parts of this year. And um, see, there's been a really broad, diverse group of stakeholders participating in the stream management plan. I came into it through my um, involvement with the National Park Service. The National Park Service has been participating, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, um, the San Juan National Forest, the Mancus Conservation District, Mountain Studies Institute, and um, and uh, local landowners. And one of the things that's unique that the Mancus Conservation District initiated in um, implementing this stream management plan is bringing on a local um, landowner from the ag community to participate and represent the ag community in the stream management planning process. So. That's been a really valuable step um, and has really added a lot to the process. So um, various activities that have been part of phase one include hydrologic modeling, which is building on a model of um, water uses by the diverse set of water users in the watershed, um, kind of identification of uh, existing data for stream uh, riparian health and and completing additional uh, riparian health assessments at different key points in the watershed and um, development of a conceptual model for river health and river improvement on the reach of the river through town in Mancus and um, development of monitoring plan and planning for um, potential future projects for river health and improvements on water use for multiple users across the Mancus watershed. So, um, overall, I think it's been a really valuable project. I'll echo what Nicole, Stacy, and Mandy have all said about it. It's really diverse. And um, I think everyone in the Mancus watershed so far who's been participating has been really um, benefiting from how this project has been moving. So, great. thanks. Well, thank you, Steve, for sharing. And Mandy, also, that's um, great to hear. And I'll just move us on and probably leave you with. Um, these, there's a lot of great benefits, but they're also very hard. <laughs> um, I don't wanna like put the rose colored glasses on here. Um, there's a lot to consider if you're gonna take on a stream management plan and there's a lot to manage. And so um, I'm gonna leave you in the chat box. Oops, pressing the wrong button here. Um, we have a questionnaire that we've developed on the Colorado SMP.org website that um, Nicole's used a lot in helping a lot of these SMPs get going and really asking the right questions around what examples are out there, who should our leadership be, how are we gonna manage this, how will we fund it, what exactly are we gonna be doing? Um, and this uh, list of questions really helps with the pre-planning process. So if you're considering doing this, I'd encourage you to look at that. Um, so I will just leave you with um, exploring more, go to coloradosmp.org. There's so much information there, um, example SMPs, um, innovations, resources. We have a community and learning page that has recorded webinars and um, all kinds of things that can help, help you dip your toe in the water of this. But um, I don't know if we have much time for questions, but if we do, uh, we're happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy and Nicole, super helpful. And I think, you know, we'll definitely share those websites for folks to, to jump into. And I, I just wanna let folks know that um, 
you know, we are we are interested in seeing if, if anyone is interested in pursuing uh, or exploring a stream management plan on the animus. Um, at the end of the meeting, we kind of wanted to get a raise of hands if folks would like to explore this idea more and try and gather this group for a smaller meeting that um, we're happy to organize in August or September. But if you have any immediate questions that Nicole and Stacy can answer right now, I'd love to open it up for a couple of questions at the moment. Well, this is surprising. I usually, oh, John, there we go. So we've definitely heard some, some talk. Uh, John, you wanna go ahead? So uh, I was curious, have you worked uh, with the uh, Corps of Engineers or um, any of the federal programs in funding these management plans? Because I know like the Silver Jackets, Jackets program, that these are old programs. I don't know if the, the Corps still is active with this or not? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the one federal program that I know has been utilized um, in the stream management planning process is the Bureau of Le Reclamation's Water Smart grants. Um, there are three or four watershed groups in the state that have, you know, applied for Water Smart grants in order to supplement their their funding to do hydrology assessments or diversion. You know, look look at like the diversion structures throughout a watershed, and um, so the Water Smart grants have been a really nice funding source for that. I am currently working with. CPW to try to get one going um, in a little drainage above Chatfield Reservoir on the Front Range called West Plum Creek. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is throwing a little bit of money into that to just get us started. But that's not a necessary, that's kind of just a like, oh, we have $10,000 that needs to be spent. So here, you know, like that, that kind of, but, but, you know, you never know, right? And these, these projects, are there's a 25% match that's required. So CWCB will provide up to 75% of the total project cost through their grant program. And that 25% match can be half cash and half um, in kind. And so $10,000 actually gets, what would it be quadrupled, I think, or more. Um, and so it actually goes pretty, like you don't need a lot of cash in order to, um, to get a, a pretty healthy budget. Thank you. John, I'll just quickly mention too that we've had some uh, conversations with folks from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment about some possibly combinations with uh, non-point source pollution funding as well. And so I think folks are getting pretty creative and I'm sure there are other folks on this call who have other ideas and, and that we could kind of work through that. So it's not such a heavy burden on local sources to contribute that cash match. Uh, any other questions at this time? Okay. Well, let's go ahead. Thank you again to Nicole and Stacy. Um, yeah, thanks, Mandy. Yeah, all right. Uh, John, let's go ahead and pass it off to you. Well, thank you, Mandy and Amanda. You guys are really great part of the community. Thanks for including me. I'm not gonna probably take as much time as I have allotted, but um, it's always great to check in with the ARC Forum. I've been part of this for a lot of years, I guess, since the gold pink spill came through. Um, so as far as the Water Quality Control Commission goes, this, uh, like you mentioned earlier, this, this is a big divergence from what we just talked about, but it's also closely tied. Um, I think I want to start off by reminding you all why we even have a commission and um, provide some context. Because historically, um, waterborne diseases have been the leading cause of death and disease among humans, and there's still a lot of present day challenges. So, and the advent, advent of community water and wastewater systems has gone a long way to mitigate this. Um, the Clean Water Act was enacted in 1972, which it seems to me really recently. Um, 
but it provides federal gu guidance and basic standards for service and groundwater. Um, the Colorado Department of Health has the Water Quality Control Division to provide recommendations for standards for the state waters for Colorado. And so the Water Quality Control and to the Water Quality Control Commission. So the commission develops water quality policy in Colorado and implements policies set forth by the legislature and the Colorado Water Quality Control Act. As a commissioner, I recognize Colorado as a headwater state. I mean, the only other one everyone knows has heard this before, but the only other headwater state is Hawaii. And so we have a big impact on a lot of downstream users. And it's an obligation I feel to deliver safe drinking water to our residents and treat our wastewater in an environmentally responsible and effective way as to not degrade water uh, available downstream users to downstream users. And then, so that's why we develop regulations and policies to protect surface and groundwater in the state. So I'm a part of a nine member commission who's appointed by the governor uh, for three year terms. And I represent, you know, the residents of the state. Um, it's kind of been in the drinking fire from a fire hose a lot for me this first year uh, as commissioner, but it's really interesting work and I, I'm really grateful to be uh, part of it. So um, kind of a few high points from this past year, uh, we have these rulemaking hearings, we meet monthly and one of the uh, ones that I'm well familiar with is Reg 11, which is for uh, drinking water in the state. <clears throat> I was involved in the stakeholder process for this regulation as the manager of the Animus Water Company back when I was doing that work and before I was appointed to the commission. And the division really does a fantastic job of, of reaching out to stakeholders uh, within the state to engage um, them in promulgating recommendations to the commission. And um, I, was, I was really impressed with working with the members of the division uh, through the stakeholder process to come up with recommendations for changes in Regulation 11. And they really listened to us. Uh, the substantive changes that we made to Reg 11 um, were the for storage tank inspections, the storage tank inspection rule and the lead and copper rule. Um, because of, uh, so there's a couple of things. There's been incidents um, within the state and nationally with storage tanks not being inspected regularly. And so uh, about five years ago, I guess they came up with a, a new rule and as it was implemented, it became apparent that it was uh, overkill and maybe onerous uh, to some small systems. And so this, through the stakeholder process, we made it more streamlined and effective and easier uh, for uh, water systems to report on, on the status of their storage tanks. And then the other one was um, for lead and copper testing. And that of course hit national news with um, the challenges they had in Flint, Michigan. Uh, most, most of uh, small systems, most of water systems really in the US community water systems don't have a challenge with this because of their water. It's because of that we have old, uh, infrastructure that includes lead piping within the system. And so we generally water quality is, is good enough. It's just when it interacts with the lead pipes within a uh, system that you end up running into trouble. And so there's been a, a big effort uh, made by the EPA and the CDPHE to replace lead service lines and, and really do try to do effective testing uh, for lead and, and copper. Um, and again, 
as a knee-jerk reaction to what happened in Flint, Michigan, the state health department um, came up with some guidelines that were really strict and uh, hard to comply with with uh, for, for a lot of small systems. A good example is, you know, locally, we just, our, our water is so pure that we just never really have interactions uh, with uh, any lead in the, in the um, if there are lead service lines to begin with. And then the other part of it is that most of, uh, besides the city of Durango, water systems within our community are, are relatively new. And so they didn't actually use any lead in their service lines. It's just lead solder is, is where you would see that interaction with the water. And so we, uh, stakeholder process revised the uh, requirements uh, in Regulate 11 to make it more meaningful and effective um, for testing for lead and copper. So that was, that was a pretty interesting process to be to go through as a stakeholder and then uh, um, as a commissioner. So that's been, that was an interesting one. Along with the <clears throat> drinking water um, in 2020, uh, the commission adopted a policy um, with regard to PFAS in drinking water. And so for those who do not know what that the acronym means, it's a, there's, there's these forever chemicals that were developed primarily by DuPont. And we have them in our everyday lives all the time. Anytime you think of anything that's any material that's hydrophobic, like Scotchgard or Teflon or there's a, there's a lot of these chemicals um, that have been developed to make our lives easy and simple and comfortable. Uh, but they do apparent there's apparent human health concerns um, with our ingest and ingestion of, of uh, these PFOS chemicals. And so um, the EPA came up with some guidance and the commission adopted a policy last year to um, help the help the water systems within Colorado understand uh, the maximum containment le levels of water of PFOS and water. Um, it was really uh, a, a collaborative effort to begin with because the CDPHE and the EPA sponsored a voluntary round of testing uh, last, I guess it was started in January of 2020. And so yeah, as a community water system, you could uh, submit a sample and the uh, EPA would have it, or I guess it was CDPHE did an analysis. And of all the systems in the state that participated, there's only a very few that they detected the PFAS in drinking water. And those were areas where they already knew there was a problem. And, and the problems that we've had in the past have been, it's really an effective way uh, for firefighters to fight chemical fires. And so they have a foam that has the PFAS. And so when earlier, early on in the seventies, I guess they did a lot of practice firefighting with these foams and it ended up uh, seeping into groundwater in some systems in the eastern part of Colorado. So kind of a roundabout way we came up with um, a policy uh, and that and it, it won't it will become part of regulate relevant regulation 11 eventually but the uh, con maximum contaminant level is 70 parts per trillion and I don't think anyone really can get their head around that it's such a small number but it's the one of those things where you just don't want to have it in your uh, body it shouldn't be in your drinking water to begin with and so a 70 part per trillion mcl is 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 is, is it's the only th thing that's it measured in that um that that minutely so it's it's something that i have a hard time as a geologist even trying to understand what a part per trillion is <clears throat> but um 
it's something I think we all need to be conscious of in our everyday lives because um, there's so many things, so many materials that we use every day, including dental floss <laughs> and a lot of uh, uh, packaging that is for like fast food, uh, microwave, microwavable things um, where there's PFAS present. And so it's something I think as a uh, individual to take personal responsibility to understand how you're being exposed to these chemicals and 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 work on it in your um, personal life. But I think having this 70 part per trillion number for water systems is going to be a good step going forward. Um, so I think that's really all the that I have on the drinking water. Um, we also uh, locally uh, had there were some issues that came up before the commission and they were uh, for discharge specific variances, discharge specific variances for wastewater treatment plants uh, in the Montezmith County that we heard some testimony about. There's a few small uh, wastewater treatment plants over there that discharge into ephemeral or uh, intermittent streams. And so they exceed uh, the nutrient standards uh, periodically. And so there's, we granted some discharge specific variances with consultation with Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, last, I guess that was last December. Uh, things coming down the pike, uh, I think a lot of you are, uh, have been paying attention to this regulation 34 is coming up. Um, we're going to have issues uh, presented in November. Reg 34 is the basic standards for the San Juan and Dolores basins. And since so, since the last time um, the commission visited this regulation, since then there's been some real significant improvements in water quality in portions of the Andes, especially thanks to the efforts of the Andes River Stakeholders Group. Um, I expect the division is going to recognize this work and in the recommendations to the commission, um, there's parts of, there's reaches of Mineral Creek that didn't have trout five or 10 years ago that do now. And so uh, hopefully this is gonna be an opportunity for us to assign better water quality standards to uphold um, in reaches of you know the Animus River, so I'm looking I'm looking forward to uh, that process. And then also, as everyone's aware, there's the Bonita Peak Superfund site up in Silverton, and the EPA is um, spending a lot of money uh, trying to understand and categorize what's what's happened with the mining, trying to understand the background. Uh, contamination of the of the animus up there, and moving forward, I'm not sure how the state and the commission are going to interact with the EPA on this, but um, it should be interesting. So <laughs> I, I, we'll see how that all works out. Um, and then the last thing I kind of want to touch on is the divisions. Um, 10 year water quality roadmap. So the division of water, uh, the Colorado Water uh, Control Division has been assigned um, and directed uh, to adopt by the, you know, from the commission and the EPA to adopt nutrient criteria to protect our string in 17 or 2018. And uh, as we move forward through 2027 or 2028, um, part, it's like Reg 34 that's coming up. We're going to take a look at all the, all the basins uh, within the state and ad adopt uh, nutrient criteria to protect these streams and lakes. And so those primary nutrients that uh, we're going to be uh, developing standards around are for nitrogen and phosphorus, chlorophyll, cadmium, temperature, arsenic, ammonia, and selenium. And so that goes for all the statewide basins. 
So that's kind of in a nutshell is what we've been working on. And that's what I've been trying to understand <laughs> in the past year, but um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any or um, have a discussion if, if you like. John, I may jump in with a, just a few of um, how can community members kind of keep track of these regulation updates and listing updates for regulation 34 and 11? Um, and you can feel free to send those links in the chat box. And uh, you mentioned a, a, a date in November. Is there still a way that folks can weigh in? In the, in the meantime, I'm not sure that timeline of and how folks. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Mandy. So um, I will see if I can figure out how to do that. But there's a the Water Quality Control Commission and Division have uh, websites, and there's a long range schedule. And so I'll I'll hear in the next few minutes or after I get done here, I'll try to get that in the chat box. But uh, we're welcome. There's I think actually in June we had a lot of public comment, and actually quite a few people from La Plata County commenting on. Um, it was at Reg 31, I think. So. Great, thank you. And I think we've got time at least for one other question if anyone has one. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. That's a lot. And thank you for uh, representing us down here in the Southwest Basin on the state level. Okay, uh, let's pass it off to Dr. Ashley Rust. Hi, Mandy. I was just trying to share my screen, um, but I cannot. So either you can uh, show the slides or you have to dis enable the sharing. I have um, made you a co host now, Ashley. Sorry about that. So you should oh, be okay. Sure. Thank you. Again. Yes, it worked. Thank you. All right, everybody, hope we can see that. Um, so uh, I, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Scott Roberts and Mandy with the Mountain Studies Institute for the last couple of years, uh, working monitoring the water quality uh, impacts from the 416 fire. Um, so that's how I got tied into this group. So I'm gonna give you an overview of those results, but first I'm gonna give you kind of a broader view and um, some take home lessons that we uh, learned from the West Fork complex fire that happened a few years earlier. So just kind of the broader view why there's so many of us out there studying forest fires and the impacts from forest fires. We know that there's more forest fires and it's largely because our season is increasing. Um, we've got a month longer on the spring and a month longer in the fall um, where our season is just longer and the trees are getting dry. And the longer the trees are dry, the more likely they are to burn. Um, and this is from another study that just showed that fuel aridity and the aridity of the trees driven by drought, uh, draw is correlated to the size of the forest fire. So as fuel aridity increases, so does the size of the forest fire. So that's kind of, you know, all related to climate change and, and drought driven uh, forest fires, but kind of explains why we see the phenomenon that is happening now uh, throughout, you know, currently California and Oregon. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done. So uh, there's a lot we don't know about forest fires. Um, so I got involved uh, as a water quality person to see uh, what their impacts on these streams are. So part of the kind of the reason why two thirds of our municipalities in the US and a third of the large cities worldwide get their drinking water from forested areas. So these are important source areas. And we know from studies that I've done as well as other people have done that post-fire erosion of sediments and ash impact the water quality. And generally wildfires release significant amount of nutrients. This isn't always the case, but it's, it's usually the case about a third of the time. And wildfires can also cause heavy metals to be mobilized sometimes as dissolved forms, but more often um, adsorbed onto that sediment that's eroding from the hillsides. So we know that the sediments and nutrients and metals alter the water quality and can harm the aquatic ecosystem, at least temporarily until the vegetation starts to grow back. 
So, you know, in general, kind of where my interest lies was how does the forest fire impact water quality, insects, and fish, um, and how quickly do they recover? Why do some watersheds recover really quickly and maybe have very minimal impacts while others do not? Um, so I started uh, working um, back in 2013 uh, with the West Fork Complex Fire. Um, I'm over here in Creed right now and, and at the headwaters of the Rio Grande. Um, and so that's what you're looking at. Um, and this was a large fire at the time. Uh, it burned 110,000 acres in um, the upper Rio Grande, just over the Wolf Creek Pass from you all. Um, and it was ignited by three lightning strikes also in a, a dry year. Uh, and it was uh, all in national forest area. And so kind of the take home of what, what we observed is really, is this, this is kind of the punchline, the, the fire altered the vegetation which exposes the soils. And when um, there's rain, it, it causes those soils to be mobilized um, into the receiving rivers, uh, which can cause fish kills. Um, and that is in fact, what we saw. We saw, uh, it, this is, came from one of the tributaries called Trout Creek um, that actually flows through uh, an old dude ranch that's been around here for a hundred years. It's a tourist dude ranch um, for fishing. Um, and they, uh, the vegetation was burned in high severity burn area. And uh, a year after the fire during the monsoon season, the pounding rain causes the soil to uh, get loose and a big landslide happened. And that's what the picture on the left is. And then the mud flowed down uh, into the river and choked out the fish. They just kind of suffocated. And so the day of this incident, uh, we measured the total suspended solids and just saw that, you know, a thousand milligrams per liter of sediment in the water uh, was enough to choke out the fish. Um, and so we're, we looked broader um, at that tributary as well as throughout the Rio Grande, up and above the fire and below the fire as our control for above the fire. And the uh, main stem of the Rio Grande also had high suspended solids um, but not quite as high as that tributary that was in the middle of the burn, um, largely because the Rio Grande was still receiving clean water from other tributaries, and that the fire impacted tributary for about three years had really high suspended solids and turbidity uh, in the water um, every time it rained, not during snow melt so much, um, but primarily during uh, the monsoon rain season. So we were, were curious how that water quality impact then impacts the insects and then the fish. So you're looking at um, a graphic of the Colorado Multimetric Index, as well as the one below it, the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index. And all I want you to notice, you don't have to understand all the sites or the locations, but the blue bars are measurements that were taken before the fire. And then um, we kind of followed the insect diversity after the fire. So a healthy population would, would be very diverse and above that 50 mark, um, a, a diverse population is a sign of good health, uh, um, both in the aquatic ecosystem and for the water quality. And what you see is the first year after the fire, those populations were hit hard. And then each year after they start to kind of bump up and recover in diversity. And in many cases within three years, we're back to their original levels. So that kind of gives, gives me hope to know that uh, mother nature recovers itself. You just have to be a bit patient. Um, it can be uh, dramatic and, and sad initially, um, but they will come back or life does return. Um, and so uh, we also wanted to look at the impacts on the fish. So we went to that burn tributary and measured the population. We did some electrofishing uh, in that stream, that trout creek above the landslide that was not impacted by the fire. And that's the, the graphic on the top. And then we also looked at the fish population below the landslide that was impacted by the fire. And what you're seeing is in a healthy population of fish, you would have small baby fish, middle-aged fish that are mid-sized mid and then large older fish, just like any healthy population, a good diversity of sizes and ages. And that's what we saw above the fire, that that's a normal stream and that's what it was before the fire impacted it. And then below the landslide, the blue bar was one year after the um, mudslide, um, or I'm sorry, it was the year of the mudslide, but one year after the fire. 
And all we caught there were these little baby fish that were less than a year old, the ones that are in my hand there. And that those are these blue bars on the graphic. And so all we, these fish were either uh, laid in the river there, the adults either spawned there and they were hatched there or they uh, drifted down from upstream. But then we went back the next year, so two years after the fire um, and, and, a, and another year after the landslide or two years after the landslide and saw that the uh, population was pretty much back to normal. There was small, medium and large fish. So that was really encouraging that even in the midst of the fire uh, where a landslide happened, the population bounced back even when we were still observing some water quality impacts from that. And then this came from some data from Parks and Wildlife. We did some, I helped them do some electrofishing on the main stem of the Rio Grande, which is a very connected river with not too many obstacles for fish. And so the take home lesson there was it's a quite resilient river that after the West Fork fire, the population was actually better than it was before the fire. And uh, it's, it's likely, even though we were observing water quality impacts on the main stem of the Rio Grande, the fish are able to move up and down the river to dodge them and, and weren't their populations were not impacted. Um, so it's kind of that a resilient river is a well-connected river. So then that work uh, launched me into working with Mandy and Scott on the 416 fire, which um, all of you folks are familiar with um, that you unfortunately experienced um, back in 2018. Um, and this area, as you all well know, um, has a legacy of mining. And so we know that there's mineral rich soils right at the surface. So we were curious how the aquatic ecosystems impacted by legacy minings, um, would, they, would, the diff, would the water quality impacts be different um, from forest fire or is it kind of a double whammy? Um, and do the heavy metals that we might see in water, do they get mobilized uh, by the fire and move up the food chain? So again, water quality monitoring and macroinvertebrate monitoring um, above the fire for control sites. And then we, so we mainly looked at these five sites where Mandy and Scott are out taking water samples. We had probes in a couple of them. Scott uh, and Mandy have taken macroinvertebrate samples at many more sites than I'm highlighting today. I'm just highlighting five of them today. Um, but we are mainly looking at the um, burned area in Hermosa Creek, and that's that kind of brown scar you see, and then each of these sites in yellow um, were water quality and macroinvertebrate sites. So we we're looking above the fire as a control site, and then in the fire and below the fire to see how wide the impact was. Um, again, I don't expect you to read the numbers on this slide. It's more just to get the general feel of what's going on. But we're looking at the water quality uh, impacts from the 416 fire with uh, four years of data. We've got pre-fire data in the white bars, and then um, each bar is a year after the, after the fire, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, and so we saw that uh, heavy metals were mobilized, uh, largely total metals that were absorbed onto the sediments. In some cases, there were um, some high dissolved metals as well. Um, but the sites on the left are our control sites at Animus River at Baker's Bridge, which is just above the burn scar. And then Junction Creek is a, was an unburned tributary that we were comparing to Hermosa Creek. Um, and what we see is, you know, the Animus River uh, has a pretty good amount of heavy metal load always moving through it from the legacy mining. Um, and so even our control site had high heavy metals, but you still see an increase, especially during storms in the Animus River um, at, at sites like at Trimble Lane and Rotary Park, um, the metals were increased or had a wider variety. But mostly the kind of big takeaway on this slide is that at Hermosa Creek before and before the fire, it was more like Junction Creek where the metals are very low and, and minimal, um, even hardly detectable, um, a fairly pristine creek. Uh, and then the year of the fire and each year subsequent um, during, especially during rainstorm events, you get uh, a lot of erosion and total metals that are mobilized in the water. Um, so it's, you know, it's neat to see it uh, play out in the data after all the hard work that goes on the ground and collecting that data. Um, but it's also neat to see the kind of trajectory of these uh, bars over time that they are decreasing. Even at Hermosa Creek, three years after, there's a significant decrease 
in the metal concentration. So each year the vegetation starts to grow back on the land, stabilizing that soil and preventing that erosion. Um, and then we looked at um, the macroinvertebrates. This is largely Scott's work. Um, so he's got some pre-fired data where you, again, you have diverse population on the left, especially the EPT sensitive species, the Femoroptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera. A lot of those species are present. And then after the fire, the year after the fire, you mainly get these pollution tolerant species like the Diptera or midges that come in that don't mind bad water quality. And that's kind of when they thrive and the sensitive species uh, temporarily go away, um, whether it's because of habitat impacts from the sediment clogging up their habitat or uh, water quality impacts that they're experiencing. So kind of as a new take on fire uh, impacts on water quality, um, we looked at uh, some of those insects that Scott collected. Uh, he took tissue samples of into a lab to see if the metals that we see in the water are accumulating in their bodies um, with implications of what does that mean for the food chain, for the fish that eat the insects and the birds that eat the fish. Um, and so what you're looking at here are the, the same metals that we observed in the water quality we see in the bug tissue. So again, mainly focusing on Hermosa above the burn and Junction Creek that weren't burned, the bars are very low and there's just a little bit of metal in their body that's probably always in the background present. But then after the fire, um, you see a high quantity, a uh, significantly higher quantity of metals in their tissue. So this is aluminum. Um, and this is true at some of the sites on the Animus River as well. Um, and then the iron, uh, which was also high in the water quality, same pattern, you see it in the bug tissue after the fire. And then lead um, as uh, was also in their tissue after the fire at a higher concentration than it was before the fire. Um, and these are again mainly in a particulate form. So to tag on to what John was saying that you guys do have good water and the water treatment plants are filtering out the water. So this isn't necessarily a contaminant that's going to end up in your drinking water, especially when it's a particle form, um, which is mainly what we observe. So that I don't mean to alarm you that you do have lead. I'm not trying to contradict John. This is a different form. This is These are particulates that get filtered out um, from really basic water treatment. Um, so really uh, the conclusion of our uh, findings from the West Fork fire during the monsoon season, that rain drives these mudslides that it causes erosion that then ends up in the river um, and we get this high turbidity and total suspended solids that can impact the fish. Um, but they in, they do recover that in our case, we that what we witnessed here it was within three years we saw recovery back to pre fire conditions. Um, and then with the 416, again, mainly during the monsoon rain season um, or just even light rains, when that soil is exposed because the vegetation's gone, you get more mudslides um, and erosion until the vegetation comes back, that stuff ends up in the river. Um, and you get with that, because you have so many minerals that are close to the surface, that's why people were there mining, um, that they carry that, the uh, sediment carries those metals to the stream. And then what we observed was that it accumulates in the insect tissue. Um, and that has implications for the food chain. Um, but that again, it's improving over time. Um, and we continue to monitor. Scott and Mandy are still out there taking samples. Um, and we really want to watch how this system recovers and try to better understand the recovery of a system that even in an area that has heavy metals close to the surface, uh, we want to see that it can recover back to a healthy ecosystem. Um, and that really, from a scientist's point of view, it's interesting, but also uh, whenever other people experience fires, such as last year, um, you, you get phone calls from the folks up on the Colorado River with East Troublesome wondering what's going to happen, what should we expect? So it's nice to take away a lesson as, as hard as it is to experience fire, um, we want to learn as much as we can from it so that we can prepare others and better prepare our watersheds for the impact. Um, and that's all. So I will um, turn it over. Any questions? I'm, I also have Scott and Mandy on board here to uh, help with questions, but I see a couple hands up. Um, we'll start. Lindsay? Thank you, Ashley. I thought that was a really nice presentation. Um, I'm curious if you've done any work 
um, in comparing wildfire versus prescribed fire and, um, and the differences. And then just kind of a request as an, an area really working on landscape restoration work and trying to educate on beneficial roles of fire on the landscape, um, the, the differentiating between wildfire and prescribed. Yeah, so that is a great question. Um, and I personally haven't done work on prescribed fires, but I work in a research group at Mines where there are a bunch of hydrologists um, that have actually one person that uh, Mount Studies recently hired, Jake has done this. Um, but they, uh, the prescribed fires are so much smaller um, than a natural fire that the acreage that they burn is just so much smaller that they hardly have a detectable impact on the hydrology or on the water quality. Every paper I've read, they, they cannot detect an impact. That there, you can detect impacts when people clear cut forests, you'll see erosion happen then because it's much greater acreage, but that prescribed fires just are big, tend to be very small um, that we just don't see the, it's, it's hard to pick up the difference um, and they tend to be very controlled, which is a good thing. Um, and then in terms of restoration, kind of what I've been preaching out here the, in Crete areas is let nature recover. If you it protect human resources, roadways and bridges and culverts, you have to do a lot of mitigation around. But where you can, um, the na mother nature comes back, you know, pretty quickly and that it's not worth building roads and compacting the soil to go plant trees when that seed bank is hopefully still there. Um, so that's kind of uh, my message, but it's still important to do restoration work around human resources that are valuable, like, you know, water intakes and that sort of stuff. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Just um, like to talk about the beneficial roles of fire on the landscape as well. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and that's, you know, it's, it is it's like a renewal. You, you are watching nature start over and it's part of these systems such as trout have evolved. Trout have evolved with fire. This is what they are used to experiencing and they some of them do die, but they, they their populations come back. Um, and it's just part, if you don't allow fire on the landscape, um, then, then you've got a heavy fuel load and you're likely to have a beetle kill and other impacts. So it is, it, that's kind of the benefit of those prescribed burns or allowing controlled fires when we can. That's what I know. Um, Callie, I don't know. I know it's, yeah, there's two of you there. I'm not <laughs> sure. Hi, uh, yeah, question. How safe is swimming in Hermosa Creek below where the fire was? Safe for children, safe for adults to swim in. So, um, you know, what we're picking up are um, heavy metals that if you were to drink the water directly in large quantities, you would have a problem over time. Um, but that really with any river, I would say E. coli is probably your biggest danger because of just natural animal feces and, and whatnot, bacteria. Um, would be your bigger danger than, um, or Jardia, than the metals that we're detecting. That what we're seeing is when storms happen is probably when you don't want to get in the water anyways, because the flows get high and muddy. I would stay out of the water because it's just unsafe for the high flows that you wouldn't be able to hold your position and you might get swept away. But on non-rain events, um, the water is fairly, is, is safe enough, certainly for swimming. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, really from Denver and I allow my kids to swim in the urban rivers, we just take a shower afterwards. So you get anything that might be on there out, out. but really it's more the, it would, it would take, you would have to ingest a lot to feel the impacts of these heavy metals and you're, and you're not going to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Paulette, I, I know there's two, again, two of you, so you're not both Paulette. <laughs> Right. Yeah, from the chemist, Clyde Church. Just uh, one to find out, uh, the aluminum and the lead reported as oxides, are they found as oxides? Oh boy. Um, so we are looking at them, and now this is a question that may be beyond what I know, but we are looking at um, the total quantity of 
the metal as a um, let's see, it's it's we're me we're measuring it with a um, ICP uh, a chemistry machine um, that just looks at the total quantity of that it would account for that metal in any form that it's present in, as I understand it. So I actually don't know what form it's in. Um, it's just that it's the total quantity of that metal present. So you could have some say iron oxides and some um, you know, ferric iron present, but we would get total, we would just be reading total metal. So not, not a great answer for that question, but that's my best answer. Yeah, oxides are very insoluble and aren't taken up very easily. So, um, or, or yeah, thank you very much then. Okay, so then I would I'd like to rephrase it and say, yes, these are the insoluble metals that we're, we're measuring. <laughs> I think you knew the answer. Good one. I'm not, not sure. Any, no. no, I appreciate it. I did. That's, that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you for some great questions. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, and I, I'm glad that you bring up, we want to better understand these and know impacts, but also know the recovery and that there can be a lot of benefits to having fire on the landscape. And hopefully we were that much better prepared for future fires, not only in our area, but across the state and the West. Um, and, and there's Ashley's email and we'll be sure to include that in notes too, if you have further questions. Um, but we're going to go ahead and pass it off to Nicole Fox and Kelly Truitt. Great. Uh, we're going to share our screen. Hi, everybody. You can see us and hear us. How do we know if we can hear us? You're great. We can hear you and we can okay. see okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is a GIS uh, mapping of beaver activity within the Silverton watershed. I'm Nicole Fox with Give a Dam. This is... Uh, I'm Callie Truitt, Give a Dam summer intern. And we, um, I decided to have uh, Callie do this research uh, GIS mapping uh, because Silverton is such a unique area for beaver activity. A little bit of background is uh, prior to the fur trade boom, there once were 60 to 400 million, million beavers in America. Um, this equated to beaver dam water complexes every quarter to half a mile on most streams and rivers. Um, currently, there are beaver dam complexes in America approximately every 50 mile stretch of streams. So what that means, um, if we were to look at historically beavers, um, beaver dams or our rivers as a series of, um, of a stringed, uh, a beaded necklace with beads on that necklace. Those beaver dams were, those uh, beads represent represented beaver dam every quarter to half a mile. So it was a very beaded, our rivers were very beaded um, with wetlands. Now, um, since there are every, approximately every 50 miles of streams, we have mostly strings with a bead here and there. Silverton, however, um, beaver complexes are a more accurate representation of what once existed historically. Um, that is why I had her uh, map this out. Sorry, I'm having to use her computer, which is a little different than mine. Change the, we're gonna change the slide. Oops. No, no, go back one, there should be one more. Yep, okay, great. So um, this is just some on the ground uh, beaver uh, activity photos. You can see on the left, there's a beaver lodge. Um, these are taken in Silverton. Here's a beaver dam. And as well, something unique to Silverton um, and is also happening in other areas where there's mine drainage going into uh, rivers, beavers are damming up. Um, the mine, the acid drainage. Here is a photo taken from Silverton of the North Star mine. Um, beavers and their waterscapes, uh, they really help to recharge the water tables. Uh, this can be incredibly helpful during a drought. They have been utilized uh, during drought to pull water from those ponds and uh, refill people's wells. Uh, they filter pollutants from water. The water settles out into the ponds um, and as well the plants, aquatic plants that grow around them like cattails take up some of the heavy metals, um, which is just part of the way 
historically our watersheds function to help filter out um, these uh, pollutants. They create forest fire resilience. Um, Emily Fairfax did some really uh, beautiful research of nine different states uh, fire, forest fires. And what she discovered um, where those forest fires um, are meet up with beaver wetland complexes. Mm -hmm. Where the beavers, uh, those complexes are, the water gets to only 115 degrees, um, meaning that the species in and around that uh, dam uh, pond area uh, has a place to recharge from. And if we think of historically there being, you know, more beads on this necklace in our riverways, um, there's more places for uh, the earth to, for nature to re, you know, to bounce back from. Um, and then as well, they act as a keystone species creating habitat mm -hmm. for, uh, for many birds, fish, amphibians, and plants. And here is her research. Um, so hi everyone, as I mentioned, I'm a Give a Damn summer intern and an aspiring GIS professional. Um, so my work this summer was to locate, identify, and digitize beaver activity within the Silverton watershed through GIS technology. Um, before going over all the outputs of my project, I would like to mention uh, Lucas Vecchio, a GIS professional Give a Damn volunteer and my mentor for this project. He is on with us today. So thank you very much for your help, Lucas. The project would not have gone on without you. So what you're looking at here is the extent of the Silverton watershed. All of the vector symbology that you're about to see was created in Arc Pro and imported into Google uh, Earth here for easy access. Um, since the people who are gonna be using this map are not GIS professionals, this is a way to bridge the gap between the GIS community and give a damn. Um, so each green circle here is representative of a dam complex, meaning that every green circle signifies an area of beaver activity that we call complexes. Um, so if you zoom in here, you can see um, an area of beaver activity sitting right at the base of the town of Silverton. This complex is made up of six beaver dams and one lodge. So I think it's pretty safe to assume that most of you are not trained to identify beaver activity through aerial imagery, um, I can point some things out to you to clear it up. Um, zooming in on now is a beaver dam. Um, on the right side of the screen is the Animus River. And if you notice, there's a pool of water to the left of the river in the center of the screen. This body of water is a result of beaver activity. Um, so the beavers created this pond when they dammed and diverted water. Also shown in this picture is um, a lodge, which is easier um, to see with beaver technology as well as or with GIS technology, it's easier to identify these areas of beaver activity. Um, so with the dam, lodge, and pond that you see here, I can show you more clearly. Um, my goal for the project was to um, take something that looks like this and create files that looked like that overlaying it. So ponds become polygons, dams become polylines, and lodges become point features. Um, so overall, I ended up digitizing 280 times between 36 dam complexes in this area, which is just a huge amount of beaver activity that I was not expecting when beginning this project. Um, so now I'd like to point out some notable findings. If you are familiar with the watershed, you'll see South Mineral Creek right here. Um, and I'm going to zoom in now on a particular complex on this creek. Oh, buffering. Um, <laughs> The complex that I'm about to zoom in on was created fairly early on in the project. Um, and South Mineral Creek, I don't know why it's buffering so much. Maybe if people can put shut their videos down, that might help this go. What do you mean? Uh, if, if everybody else could shut their video off, it might give us uh, what we need for this to, to run. I think because it's such a big program, it's slower because we're on Zoom. I see. Um, well, I can just kind of talk you through uh, while we wait for the visual aid to load, but right here is South Mineral Creek. And this is an area with an unusually high amount of beaver activity. There was um, about 38% of the digitizing that I did all came on South Mineral Creek. Here we go. Um, so this particular complex that you're looking at, I did early on, and it is one of the 14 complexes on this creek. Um, and there were 89 dams total digitized, which as I said, was 36%. Um, so 
since this is a video and not actual Google Earth, uh, I can't demonstrate, but if you were to click on any of these features here, uh, a table would pop up with additional information, which is useful to the people who are going to be using this uh, information, like what stream it's at and um, some other attributal information that can be used in the future. So that's another benefit of working um, in Google Earth is that you can still have the attribute table like you would in Arc Pro. Um, so the last thing I wanted to focus in on is Mineral Creek here. Um, so this is Mineral Creek, and this is all one dam complex that is made up of 56 dams, which is just a huge number for a dam complex. Um, and this is the largest and most notable uh, work that I did digitizing beaver dams. And it really just shows how, um, how much the beavers have impacted this area. Um, like Nicole was saying that the Silverstone watershed is um, unusually uh, compared to the rest of the country, it's an unusually high area of beaver activity. Um, so overall, about 85% of the Silverton watershed is currently digitized, and the areas of orange circles are areas of beaver activity that are flagged but have not yet been digitized. So a future goal of the project is to continue digitizing these areas. Um, I'll also say a future goal of the project is to maybe counteract some of the flaws of the work um, because it is hard to identify beaver activity using aerial imagery. So the future goal of the project is to ground truth uh, the work that I did and make sure that what I said is a dam is in fact a dam um, and stuff like that. So that is the output as far as the interactive files go. And that was the main portion of the project. I also created a layout that kind of is an overview of the Silverton watershed and the areas of beaver activity. Um, so you can have easy access to that. Um, yeah, so um, uses in the future, uh, the BRAT, the Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool, um, has been created for our area. Uh, this was done by a CSU student. However, more research is needed to create an accurate representation of the beaver activity in our area. Um, that map that was done, it doesn't really show accurately, and that's partly why I had Kelly do this research so that we can get more you know, accurate uh, representation of our area. Uh, like she said, we need to ground truth this with um, their Defenders of Wildlife has created a um, iBeaver, a crowdsourcing app for data um, on beaver activity. And I'll um, be taking volunteers out and helping them to uh, input you know, data as well. That's something that you all can do. Uh, you know, download this app and add this, uh, add any beaver activity that you see. Um, you know, the biggest reason is that, you know, restoring our watersheds, uh, you know, with beaver and beaver mimicry like low tech process based restoration um, really can be a solution to restoring our water tables, um, assisting in na nature and fire resilience, healing the pollutants that our watersheds store, and bringing back precious habitat for wildlife. Um, if you have any questions down the road, you can email me at give a damn as well. I put up there the crowdsourcing uh, app through Defenders of Wildlife and um, there's Callie's email um, if you wanna contact her about her research. Um, and I'll just say that overall, this project was very impactful to myself as a future GIS uh, professional, to Nicole and her organization, Give a Damn, and hopefully to our watershed and Animus River as a whole. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Uh, can I answer any questions? I'm not sure how to tell if... Um, perfect. And we can leave um, our information in the in the chat box okay. so Hi, I've got a, this is Jim I got a question to Cole and Callie um, this is fantastic and I always like to think big and I'm curious um, Nicole with give it damn have you thought about um, kind of what could be the next phase in this which is is uh, looking at other watersheds in the area that you know, historically had beavers seeing what there's now and then so um, could indicate to us uh, good areas for beaver relocation or, you know, general support for beaver populations. 
Uh, really good question. So that's exactly what this was done for, um, is just pro pro preliminary work um, in doing water restoration, you know, using beaver and modeling it after what was once there historically, letting the beavers do the work um, instead of putting in a bunch of, you know, funding into, uh, you know, bigger reservoirs or, uh, you know, fire resiliency measures, uh, combating you know, drought, this is a really inexpensive way to go about um, restoring our watersheds and helping to, you know, if we can re restore the, um, you know, the green water infrastructure, um, then, you know, we can, uh, I think, move in the direction of water restoration. Um, yes, so I am going to be taking out uh, some volunteers, uh, a group uh, from Escalante to uh, hopefully ground truth at least some of this uh, research here in Silverton. And as well, it's open for, you know, other ones, I think it's going to take time. Um, um, and uh, but I'm happy to you know organize with other folks in uh, making sure that people get trained in that eye beaver uh, um, uh, you know app and then uh, helping with you know water restoration and uh, live trapping of beaver relocation down the road. Um, I'm discovering uh, in this process that I've been in is that it's a slow process and uh, to have patience uh, with all the agencies and with uh, what it takes to you know, really create this kind of change. And so I really wanna thank you know, all the people who went before me um, and all the work that they're doing in uh, water uh, you know, restoration. Um, people have put in a lot of effort and energy and time and funding. And um, you know, that's how we're able to be where we're at now. Great, thanks, Nicole. Yeah, and it's really exciting. I mean, for people who don't know, the fact that the EPA is working in restoration, you know, using beavers as part of that whole scheme is, is very significant. I think um, it's pretty uh, cost effective too. So thanks again for your work. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, great work, Callie, and, and hopefully we'll see more uh, digitizing and mapping from you in the future and hear more about how to use this iBeaver uh, app and see how, how the ground truth thing turns out later this year. Um, great, man, I love these meetings. I learn something new every time and just we get to learn about issues and influences in our watershed and potential solutions like this. So cool. Um, all right, I think I wanna pass it off to our, our wonderful Art Forum partners for some updates. Uh, first up, we've got and feel free to stop sharing your screen anytime. Thanks, Kelly, appreciate it. Um, we're gonna hear first up from Marsha Porter Norton from Oplata County um, to hear some about some water policy updates. Feel free to start, Marsha. Thanks everybody. And it's great to see all of you. I, uh, I really commend this group. I remember being involved in it in the early days as are so many people on this call and it's Really great to see where it has come to and just the great learning today, wonderful presentations. Um, I wanted to let you know about a couple things that La Plata County is up to. And I know we have I have a fellow commissioner on this call, uh, Commissioner Church, so he can certainly chime in after I go through this and uh, we're available for questions. I'll, I'll put my contact in the chat. First of all, a couple things, is a couple of you have probably heard a couple of years ago about something called the Southwest uh, Wildfire Impact Fund or SWIF. And um, former Senator Ellen Roberts, who is on this call and was instrumental in getting this group started, um, came to both the county and the city with a consortia, including MSI, to do a, a very ambitious and visionary project to essentially look at La Plata County, uh, the, the SWIFT is a regional effort, but they started with this particular concept in La Plata County to look at um, landscape scale wildfire restoration work to improve safety, to bring um, to, you know, what happens with the um, debris and timber and slash and trees coming out of treated areas. So economic development and then water quality. So this is very much, these discussions have been going on since last year. Um, where we have come to is that SWIFT is, has helping 
the city of Durango, La Plata County, and the Durango Fire Protection District put together a consortia of our own. And we would like to uh, take advantage of state grant money, uh, money pretty much anywhere that we can get it through grants to initially do what we're calling a phase one project. And that is to treat the Florida River watershed, which would also include the Upper Pine Fire Protection District. And then areas that we could consider prevailing winds that if a fire got going in them and they are at high risk on La Plata County maps would bring that fire into the city of Durango. So we have a lot of detail work to do. Um, I just wanted everybody to know about it, that this is very much in process. The city has committed um, 100,000 for two years and the county has committed 45,000 this year to the entire effort. Uh, through the uh, work of MSI, Aaron Kempel and Ellen, um, a, gr a grant through the WIN program, and Ellen may need to correct me on some of this, um, and the EPA would bring 311,000 in. And the idea is to focus on private lands and really team that work, of course, on a voluntary basis with landowners, but team that work up with where other work is happening. And so that you really, uh, one quote that really stuck with me as we've been having these discussions is it, you know, we don't know, it doesn't matter where the fire starts. It could start in somebody's backyard in Durango and go backwards into the wildland inner interface, so to speak. It could start in Leitner Creek, like we saw a couple uh, years ago and almost make it over the hill. Any of Durango's open spaces that have all kinds of things going on in them, people uh, unfortunately camping at times. Um, with campfires. So there, you know, it could start on Forest Service, State, BLM, all of it. So we're looking at a landscape scale project. We um, are very well positioned to do this with our MRI in the region and other such efforts. And so you're going to be hearing more about that. Um, and uh, right now we're trying to figure out what the specific structure is that we would form in order to accept funds. And so that's what we're working on currently. And I really want to thank MSI and Ellen Roberts and the group that brought this to the city and county. I think it was really visionary. Um, looking at these slides on what happens during drought and what happens to rivers and uh, nothing could be more applicable right now, really, as far as I'm concerned. So um, Ellen, I know you're on the call. I don't know if you want to kind of putting you on the spot here. I don't know if you want to add anything but um, you know, we will be looking to pretty quickly um, get this launched and then SWIFT will continue its work regionally. And um, again, really brought the vision to these two particular, well, three governments really, because fire districts are special districts. So Ellen, I don't know if you want to say anything. Again, I'm putting you on the spot. No, you, you did great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to let everybody know is that on the, um, we have two new commissioners, myself and Commissioner Salka, and on the 6th of May, we had a comprehensive water uh, work session, and I just thought I would let everybody know what La Plata County's water priorities are. We are currently in the process of updating them. I don't think they're going to change drastically. What would change or be added is things that we could do, um, you know, ways to implement these priorities. So one is water infrastructure in the un unincorporated part of La Plata County. If you live in an area where you have a good well or you live in a subdivision that has municipal water or a town or city, sometimes we forget there are people in La Plata County that need to haul water and don't have access to good potable water. So. Water infrastructure is, is a timeless goal of La Plata County. By the way, with our ARPA funds, um, one of the things that we can fund is water, water sewer and actually broadband is considered infrastructure. And we're looking at ways to equitably do that. Um, we have water rights as, uh, as a county for our own operations, including we jointly manage an airport with the city and so we are gonna be looking for ways to make sure those water rights are used. And anybody that may have an interest in those, please let us know they're out of the Animus River. Um, we're interested in water sensitive land use planning. And one of the visions we put forth, I don't know that we know exactly how we're gonna get there, is to be one of the benchmark counties in Western Colorado for wise use of water, water conservation, 
um, education of citizens about water use, especially in um, what now is feels sometimes like the new normal. I hope it's not that these severe and exceptional droughts. And so what can we do as a county to just educate citizens about water use any way we can, including when people are coming through the development process. Um, foster intergovernmental co co cooperation, protect water quality. I actually forgot to mention I'm on the steering committee of this group. Very honored to be asked and uh, replace former Commissioner Julie Westendorf. And that's one way that I think La Plata County can express our support for good water quality efforts. We track very, very closely what's going on with the Bonita Peak um, through the CAG and through Bonita Peak, actually um, the folks from EPA and the CAG giving us regular updates. So we're very interested in what's going on um, in the upper basin since that's where um, a lot of folks water, we're interested just in general, but also it's where a lot of La Plata County people get their water, uh, either directly or through wells. Um, supporting conservation efforts and eco uh, environmental preservation is a goal. Agriculture and the local economy and then where the SWIFT uh, project, which is now called the Wildfire and Watershed Protection Fund, that's going to be our name for what we're doing. Um, supporting forest health and wildfire mitigation efforts and then um, opposing Trans Mountain and Trans Basin diversions of water. I think that's kind of timeless from La Plata County's perspective. So I go through all this level of detail. I'm, I'm going to put in the chat our water packet that the staff developed for us. I just put it in there. Um, really want to reach out to anybody that has an interest in this and give us input about how we update these policies. And um, obviously, we look to um, the Southwest Water Conservation District and other groups um, who we either appoint someone to or just interface with in some way to get this work done. But we are taking a look at our water policies and appreciate all comments and feedback and input as we go through that process. Thank you so much, Marcia. I'm gonna keep it going because we're uh, trying to wrap up here. Um, we also wanted to hear from Southwestern Water Conservation District, uh, Steve or Laura, I'm not sure which one of you would like to take it away. That's fine. I think Laura had to leave. Um, and I'll be brief. Again, my name is Steve Wolf. I've been in the job of general manager ever since July 1st of this year. So I am still trying to get my feet under me and understand all the aspects of this job. Um, it's, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm enjoying it. I look forward to getting out on the ground and meeting with all of you, hopefully in the very near future. I guess the only announcement I would make is that Four Corners Water Center and the district are sponsoring a water seminar in September, September 21st at 5 p.m. at the college. Um, trying to finalize the agenda now, but I think we're going to have a good program um, up there. And I've asked Gigi to fill in any of the blanks or correct anything that I might have said wrong about that because we're sponsoring, co sponsoring with them. So nice to meet you all. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Steve. I, I think you uh, you nailed it. It'll um, the Eventbrite will be heading out soon. I think Laura's got a draft of that. So, um, and we have a draft program. There'll be a keynote and then a panel um, topics related to forest health and snow and our water supply and lots of opportunities for talking to each other and networking and eating some food and just. Um, reconnecting. So uh, we're excited about the opportunity to be in person in the ballroom at Fort Lewis on September 21st at five. So thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Steve and Gigi. Welcome to this uh, little corner of Colorado. And uh, I'm sure you'll meet more of these folks around the call in the coming months. Okay, and next up we have the San Juan Watershed Group, Alyssa. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, one, I just want to thank everyone for really convening and being able to, to, to work together for these meetings. It's always really fantastic to be able to join these and learn what's going on upper reaches of the San Juan watershed. Um, I wanted to provide a brief update for you guys on some activities and projects that we have coming up for the San Juan watershed group in New Mexico side. Um, we are going through our second phase of a human bacteria uh, sampling study that is a follow up of our who pooped in the river, a study from 2013 and 14 that Melissa May from the San Juan Soil Water Conservation District and folks from Mountain Studies Institute assist us with. Um, that study was able to find a, a magnitude of, of a, a 
quantifiable magnitude of increase in human fecal bacteria, uh, human source bacteria, the specific species, um, bacteria dorii in the San Juan River. And this one is really going into more of a hotspot analysis over 17 sampling locations um, between Blanco and the hogback boundary of the Navajo Nation, um, looking at potential point and non-point sources. Um, this data that we're going to be collecting is going to be once a month um, between July and October of this year, um, with our first sampling date coming up on July 28th. So I wanted to be able to give an invite to everyone um, if you want to either one, join on a raft trip to be able to help collect samples or two, uh, jump on a vehicle to be able to learn um, you know, how we're doing the process, what we're hoping to get out of this and be able to have a hang out with us for a little bit. Um, we have, we're gonna be collecting that data um, for try and answer a few questions. One, being able to see if there's a significant non-point um, sections of the river from residential communities or from select tributaries on the San Juan that could be contributing both E. coli and human uh, fecal source bacteria. Um, but also looking at wastewater treatment plants. Um, we're going to be side by side comparing um, our quantification of E. coli um, that is culture dependent um, and comparing it to DNA dependent of human source fecal bacteria. You'll be able to see how much of human signal is actually coming from wastewater treatment plants and how much of that may actually even, if it is, even a human health concern. Um, also wanted to give you guys an update that um, we will be incorporating this data into a San Juan restoration plan that we hope to have a draft of by summer of next year. Um, this will be looking at mostly on bacteria, water quality issues, but we'll also be focusing on other topics um, such as riparian restoration with help from our partners at BLM, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, others. Um, so I'd be happy to provide a presentation on this later on, preferably after October, so I can give you guys the juicy details of all the data that we get. But thanks for your guys' time. Thanks so much, Alyssa. And if we've still got Colleen on the line, we might have a short one more addition. Colleen, go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about citizen science water quality monitoring, and we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Hi, all. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to come in and chat with you guys. Uh, my name is Colleen. I am working in natural resources with Mountain Studies Institute. I am part of um, their intern for the grant from Great Outdoors Colorado, which is focusing on visitor impact and mitigation in the San Juan County. And one part of that that we actually just got off the ground this past weekend is our citizen science water quality monitoring program. Uh, very similar to sounds like what they have going down at San Juan Watershed. Uh, but we are using a team of about 22 citizen scientists that we recruited from the community, monitoring 16 sites in San Juan County, um, mostly up in the Silverton, right around Silverton area, including the Ice Lakes Basin region that we are hoping to get sample on, samples on during the 2021 year to kind of use as, as a baseline while there are no humans in the region while it is closed due to the impacts from the fire. I'm um, going down to Mineral Creek and Potato Lake and a whole bunch of different areas, um, really focusing on places that we think have a large impact from human recreation that have seen large increases in human presence during the pandemic and just in general as, as we see visitation numbers increase in the region. So our first sampling event was this past weekend, started on Saturday and ended today. We are going out four times this summer, um, all the way from this weekend to September 8th. And we are going to be taking that data that we collect and turning it to outreach and interpretive material that we hope to spread around San Juan County and really reach out to people as part of Leave, leave No Trace principles and just backwater recreation or backcountry re recreation, proper usage for, for human waste disposal. Um, I'm starting to see some data come in for my volunteers already. And I will say that the numbers are pretty high, higher than I was, I was hoping to see. Um, but that means that we're going to have a lot of material to, to talk to people about. Um, and so we're very excited. We will also be doing two samples or two sampling events that are going to the San Juan Basin Public Health. So we're going to be running our own um, filtration procedures and then using San Juan Basin Public Health as well to just kind of get some extra input from there. Um, but it's going really well and we're really excited that we had such community support and participation in our program. Thank you so much, Colleen. Man, there's a lot happening all over our watershed and we've got a lot to digest. And I just wanna throw up on our 
screen that, um, you know, we talked a lot today about different efforts and we're gonna reconvene this group again in October, but um, circling back to that stream management plan, which can possibly, if folks are interested, kind of incorporate all these monitoring and research efforts and things that are happening across the landscape. And so I've already gotten um, notification from a few folks, Marcel and Warren, who would kind of like to sit down and, and suss that out more if that's possible um, on the Animus. And so if anyone else, feel free to raise your hand, send your name in the chat box, or just send an email to either me or Amanda afterwards, and we'll, we'll try and um, send out a poll of dates that folks can participate in. Um, but thank you again to all of you for taking the time, and I'm just still always amazed at all the work that's happening across the watershed. And, yeah, that's it for me, unless anyone else has uh, questions you'd like to end the conversation on. I'll just echo Mandy. Thank you so much for everyone for making time for this today. We're so glad to have you as part of this conversation. Yeah. And uh, hopefully in October, we may do another virtual meeting because it allows us to bring in presenters from afar, but um, perhaps we'll get to do uh, an in-person field trip. You know, maybe we'll check in with Jordan, see maybe some of those 416 recovery projects may be available to see or, or somewhere else along the watershed. We've got a lot of work going on out there. So thanks everyone. And we'll send out meeting notes with links to all these different events and resources. Take care all. Thank you. Amanda, you want to hang on just a little bit longer? Mm -hmm. You can stop recording if you like. Oh.